We're working in partnership with Charles Tirrett across the ashes. Charles Tirrett is the fine British menswear brand that makes it effortless for men to look sharp. They're loved globally for their range of shirts, suitable for work and home, as well as their fine tailoring, which extends to superior suits, blazers, chinos, refined polos and loungewear. If you fancy the chance to win a £500 voucher to spend at Charles Tirrett, simply visit the link in the description for this show. Entries close at midnight on 23rd of December to enter the competition. Simply follow the link in the description of the podcast. Um, we previously mentioned our exclusive offer for the Wisden audience as well. Enjoy 20% off everything with Charles Tirrett using the code <coughs> WISDEN20. So you've not just got the 20% discount code, you've got the chance to win a £500 voucher. Um, we're all currently wearing Charles Tirrett attire here in the office. That's one for our YouTube audience to appreciate. Anyway, on with the show. Uh, we're recording this just under 48 hours ahead of the Adelaide Test, the second in the Ashes. We'll talk through all the latest Ashes news, all other happenings in the world of cricket in the last week, including Virat Kohli's ousting as India ODI captain. And we'll also be previewing the latest issue of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, which is out later this week. I'm Yaz Rana, and with me today is the managing editor of Wisdom.com, Ben Gardner, the magazine editor of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon, and the editor-in-chief of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Phil Walker. Phil, you went on the pod after the Gabba test. Um, what were your views on the test? Um, at least England had a plan A. Eh? <laughs> and now a plan B, uh, and probably a plan C and D. Mm. Um, I, I, from a personal perspective, I was pleased to really feel something, feel something really uh, akin to sort of a violent, impotent anger uh, after the second day in particular. In fact, I was angry by half 11 in the evening when, when they won the toss and, and bowled first. But... Um, Funny oh, you used the word anger. First. It's funny that you used the word anger as well. It's exactly what Joe said. I think, I think we both show. surprised ourselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I was. It was nice to feel something. It was. It was good to feel something, even if it was, uh, as I say, a kind of swirling, impotent rage um, out there in my bedroom on my own, staring at the walls. Uh, it was a peculiar experience that, that that first couple of days. It felt like, and we, like we've been here before. It felt as ever, like this self-fulfilling thing where as soon as we land in Australia, it's like we're sucked into this vortex of shit, you know, if you like, sorry. You might want to change the, change the wording on that. And there's so much, in fact, you lot were touching on this in the show the other day, there's so much mythologizing around the whole thing, so much sort of history revisiting and general aggrandizement around the whole, uh, the, the whole kind of iconic nature of this beast, that by the time you get there, it's like we've, it's like we're almost kind of predestined to collapse, predestined to sort of live out our sort of, our, our kind of fever dreams that we've all experienced from sort of Joe Root down to down to you and me, uh, and there there was this kind of crushing air of predictable, inevitable, uh, um, shooting oneself in the foot nature. You know that that first that first session. To be 11 for three in 20 minutes. The Burns thing, we've, you've discussed the Burns thing to, to, to within an inch of its life, and I'm not sure how much more life he's got as well in an England shirt, certainly in the short term. Uh, I, found it, I found it deeply bewildering uh, and frustrating because we're not an especially good test side at the moment, um, and there are some players in there that are uh, either underperforming or aren't especially good in in the, in the grand scheme of things but the same can kind of apply to australia as well it, it, and yet when they walk out they're 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 kind of give and take players they grow and ours seem to shrivel and shrink you know and i just found it very very frustrating um and then you roll it through to to, to the aftermath and you hear certain kind of pronouncements from the england lads and you understand why they're talking in a positive kind of way, but then you get sort of banalities from from the coach, Chris Silver, talking about how they actually discussed how they would react collectively and emotionally to the possibility of losing a wicket with the first ball. Now, okay, maybe inside the dressing room, swirling with kind of over planning and and over analysis, as it as, as as tends to happen now with modern sports teams, I get that maybe you are going to discuss that, keep it keep it on the down low, keep it on the level, but then to kind of announce that to the world's media two days after it, and we all knew what we all know what happened anyway. I just find that baffling. It kind of 
sort of childish, really, a, ch- a childish naivety, which has been kind of echoed for the last week from mm. the moment that we turned up there and won the toss. Yeah, it's it's the sort of thing. You, you, it's the sort of thing you might pat yourself on the back if if Burns had gone first ball and England ended up. 220 for one or 220 for two at the end of the day you might mention it as a sort of pat on the back this is the sort of stuff we're doing and it's working to do it and then tell everyone about it when you've ended up 11 for three and you've ended up all out on (laughs) it's just extraordinary and I think in a way kind of sums up uh, a lack of guile in Chris Silverwood's leadership you just don't say that stuff I just can't imagine any other international coach being foolish enough to say a line like that and you know in the grand scheme of things it's insignificant but I found it frustrating and uh yeah, quite revealing. It reminded me of something that Ian Bell said, so that we've got a two-part YouTube series of Butch and mm. Ian Bell playing golf, um, and they're just talking about all things Ashes. I uh, would recommend it. But Bell says that prior to the 10-11 series, there was some of that chat before the series, like what happens if we go 1-0 down, whatever. David Saker says, what happens if we're 3-0 up? How do we go into the fourth test 3-0 up? And Bell said that completely revolutionised how they... That's English <laughs> and Australia right exactly, there. <laughs> exactly, and it completely changed how England felt going into the series like actually no what happens if we're ahead what, yeah. what, what we're going to be like when we're ahead but, but sure, preparing... surely any sports psychologist worth their salt is trying to suppress those kinds of conversations within the dressing room because it just trans transfers or transmits these kinds of anxieties onto the the poor bugger he's got to go out there and face that first ball <laughs> and you know I, i'm not <laughs> making kind of astral excuses for for Rory Burns kind of taking his foot to right extra cover and missing a leg stump half volley, um, which incidentally Shane Warne insisted didn't swing despite the fact that it <laughs> went around corners. <laughs> Talking about the, the commentary is another story entirely. Uh, but yeah, I just, I just, m- my heart sank when I read that this morning. Ben sent it on the WhatsApp group. Obviously he was up and ready at 20 past seven this morning, sending, sending his stuff through. Yeah, the first thing I saw when I grabbed the, grabbed the sleep out of my eyes and, and I thought, oh my word. Yeah. It, it just feels, um, it feels kind of inept. It does yeah. feel like if you talk lots about being naught for one, that's going to make it more likely yeah. that you're naught for one, not, yeah. not, not less likely. Yeah. And he all said in that quote, like we also t- planned for if we uh, dropped a catch in the first over and England also dropped loads of catches. Like uh, <laughs> when you talk about, you know, you know taking but, your but chances and scoring runs. Yeah, it's but it's also that, like the intellectual paucity of it. So, so how else are you going to react? What are you going to do? Kind of you know, take all your clothes off and run around the perimeter of <laughs> the boundary. You're obviously just going to go, all right, well, you know, teams lose wickets early doors. We crack on, we move on. To actually vocalise it, to put it into players' minds. Yeah. I, I'm quite with anxiety in- through the roof anyway. anyway I, I am because. quite interested that both of you uh, used the word angry so early on in both your answers in the last two pods because I don't know Joe didn't sound angry on the the pod he he just sounded weary yeah it was it was early in the morning um, I was also here on a Saturday morning that might have fed into it (laughs) I I want to add I've had a lovely week I moved house that's why I wasn't on the show on Saturday yeah Yeah, thank you very much Um, I've had a lovely week um, but Ben for me I I, I don't really I don't really feel angry I I, I find it funny almost I'm not angry I'm just disappointed no it's just comic like the whole thing and also I think it's different to 2017-18 in that there's been another Ashes where England were really bad. And now it's just kind of, uh, I guess, the, my memory of Ashes series away is, is, is my expectations going to be even more negative than they were before. So now it is just funny when it kind of goes that badly. Like. Yeah, so I've, I've kind of resigned and then you weirdly start taking the positives quite quickly. Like, it's like oh, it looks like, looks like Butler played nicely. You know, it's like... <laughs> Good 30. Well, yeah, exactly. And then, but then even when England were, what, 220 for, for two overnight, uh, uh, I was at... I was, at a party that evening so I was sort of following it rather than sort of waking up and, and, and watching the day's play the next day uh, so you're uh, just sitting in the corner just on your phone weren't you uh, there, there were a few cricket fans there so there was you know I was just <laughs> oh, crowded around circle, yeah. in the kitchen <laughs> they're glad they invited you <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so yeah and then it, but I did just I kind of knew that that was how it was going to play out like uh, there was quite a funny thing where people sort of making fun of predict viz uh, the crit crit viz tool for saying like it's a bit pessimistic suggesting they're going to be 298 all out isn't it they were t- two nine seven all out, and they were <laughs> that was a good one. Great for that one. Yeah. Um, I think it might, might be worth clarifying as well. I, I can't speak for Phil, but my anger isn't. I, I can cope with England losing. I'm more than Used familiar that. with that, yeah. and I thoroughly expect them to do so. But it was the fact that it felt like the battle was over <laughs> so soon into the series. That's what frustrated me because more than anything, we want a good series so we can talk about it over the next few weeks, and it's still actually matters come the fourth and fifth test yeah it, 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 it was day two 
that really sent me sent me to the edge. That first session on day two in England, I thought Wokes bowled okay without bowling brilliantly, although I do fancy him in this series overall. But I thought Wood and Robinson were superb. I know you spoke about this earlier, but mm. that that first session destroyed me, I think, you know, and, and, and Davy Warner, you know, was scrapping, but he couldn't really lay a bat on it. The the moment that really um I almost collapsed in on myself was when Labashane, who batted beautifully and is a stunning player, as we all know, but pushes at one, as Root had done 24 hours later, Root carries to first slip. Root is at first slip 24 hours later, and it's right on the half volley when Labashane's on maybe 15 or 20 odd or whatever. Now, if that carries, how can you be too far back mm. at, at, at the Gabba? You know, and all the cord and shuffle forward, and you're like, Surely you figured yeah. this out. Yeah, and it wasn't a real soft hand prod. I mean, he has no, gone at the push, ball. Proper hard push, push, yeah. He has yeah. gone at the ball. Yeah. And look, I'm not saying that the result would have been different, but they'd have got a damn sight fewer than 420-odd if, you know, Burns had caught his, his catches. And if England had just had a, a, a scintilla of luck. Yeah, we, we've been very, very downbeat about it, but I do think the result flattered Australia. I don't think they batted that well. Labashain and Head apart, and I think Head be- benefited from... Bowling that you just rarely see in Test cricket, really. England were completely shot by the end of that day. Um, some some big news from the Australia camp. Josh Hazelwood has been ruled out of the second Test. He's the number three ranked bowler in the world. Averages less than twenty two in Test cricket over the last three years, and and crucially less than twenty in day night tests. Although um, that's actually worse than Stark and Cummins in day night tests. Okay, <laughs> so he's um, the, he was the weak link yeah. in their attack ahead of the day night well, tests. Well, he'll be replaced by either Michael Nisa or Jai Richardson. And Joe, you were saying before we were recording that um, not only are both very, very good bowlers, but they're both quite handy with a bat as well. Yeah, well, we, we talked on, on Saturday about the fact that Australia's low order is so much stronger than England's already. Uh, and it feels like, well, that is, that is going to be further um, strengthened with, it looks like Richardson will probably get the nod, which is a bit harsh on, on Nisa, who's been the kind of next man in for a long period of time and took five for against the Lions. And is almost an all-rounder. I mean, he's a bowling all-rounder, but he, he's got first-class hundreds, Averages kind of mid to high 20s. Uh, but even Richardson averages in the 20s as well. If Nisa plays, you'd probably have Stark maybe batting at 10. And he's got 10 50s in Test cricket. Averages uh, more than Rory Burns in Test cricket in the last two and a half years. Right. Okay. That is a, de- that is a depressing stat. That's and, a devastating <laughs> stat. And there is a possibility that Ollie Robinson is England's number eight in this Test match. Now, it might not play out like that, but that that is... That is a big deficit to be trying to overcome before you even start the test match. If, yeah. if I mean, start would be comfortably England's number eight. If well, not ahead of Wokes, but if, if Wokes doesn't play, start would absolutely be England's number eight. Yeah, and especially the day night test as well, which can be a bit sort of like trading blows. Uh, to lose your top order sort of quickly. Thing. You need to, to, to kind of rebuild. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. you can get a sparky eighty run partnership down the order that can push you up to two twenty, which can be a competitive total. So that yeah could, could be a factor. Yeah, I can see that. Um. If Nisa plays, that'll be two Glamorgan players in the Australia eleven. <laughs> um, who were the last? Who was the last Glamorgan player to play Test cricket for England? Simon Jones. Is it Simon Jones? Yeah. So there'll be more. No one Glamorgan. since two thousand and five. Yeah. Really? Wow. So that so there'll be more Glamorgan players playing one Test for Australia than than for England in the last sixteen years. Interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, at the time to- at the time of recording, uh, David Warner is an injury doubt. Uh, he was hit on the ribs by Ben Stokes in Australia's first innings. He didn't bat in the second innings and spent a very long time off the field as well. Um, I think Travis Head said today that Warner will probably play, but Ben, tell us about the guy who could come in for Australia if Warner does miss out. Well, my, my, I think the most likely thing still is uh, Usman Kawaja just coming in, slogging at the top of the order. He's got a brilliant record as an opening batsman in Test cricket. Um, uh, Alex Kerr obviously opening that second innings. I don't think they'll go with that uh, as an actual plan. But there's this guy, uh, Bryce Street, um, who is what, 22, 23, uh, average about 40 in, in, in first class cricket. So he's, uh, he can play. I think the, the really interesting thing is just quite how slowly he scores. So obviously, we, 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 you know, Sibley gets maligned for his low scoring rate. Street has a, a, a strike rate seven runs below Sibley's in first class cricket. He scores about run it, one run every, every three balls. Uh, he got a pretty slow 100 in the warm up game or in the game against the Lions for Australia A uh, when Nick Madison and Mitch Marsh were both scoring about. 200 and he was just there sort of uh you know nudging and nerdling and that sort of thing so it could be i mean you know if it's a a, a slow score and marcus harris at the top of the order at least England aren't getting a <laughs> aren't going to be 100 for naught down at lunch gonna be quite um, though isn't it yeah well that, that, that that's the thing but I, but I guess I, what water will play well that sounds yeah. it did from i read a kind of report of his net which sounded like he wasn't facing any 
proper deliveries. He was just having throwdowns, and he was apparently like actually wincing with pain when he was playing cross bat shots. So. Right. Okay. And given that Australia said Hazelwood's fine, Hazelwood's fine. Don't worry about it. He's fine, and he obviously wasn't. Mm. I don't really trust what they're saying about Warner either. Mm. I, I don't think they would want to let England know out know a few days out from the match that Warner isn't going to play. So I, who knows? But I, I think there's a I think there is a chance he won't play. I guess, yeah, I guess I, Travis I, Head was never going to be the one who's going to announce that Warner's out of the Test match. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess also if, the, if Australia were two and up or three and up at this point, they might be more tempted by streaks. I think they do see him as one for the future, whereas Quadri is obviously uh, mid-30s. They start but building for the future halfway through the Ashes. That really... <laughs> Um, Phil Wood and Robertson were very good at Brisbane Wokes was pretty good and in my opinion is the only feasible option to bat at eight Anderson and Broad or Anderson and Broad Jack Leach didn't go great what do you think they should do for the bowling attack at Adelaide oh god um, you, oh, I wish you'd I, I just wish I'd done a bit of research on this I think I think Broad and Anderson really prob- probably both play um, I'd possibly not play Wood in this one and play him in the third game which will be at Melbourne which is sounds almost paradoxical but that is a that's a dead track traditionally it's only in recent years it's a drop-in hybrid pitch so you kind of need a bit of otherness I think at Melbourne possibly more than you need it at Adelaide which might give you a bit more with the pink ball so I might be tempted to rest Wood for that test match um, I can see the logic in that but it is Counterintuitive, isn't it? That you're one nil down in a series, and you drop your most aggressive, fastest bowler, and then with a the theory of bringing him back in. But sure, <laughs> but but then can he play five in six weeks? It's a big ask. It's and big, and big this ask. is it. We, we we constantly tie ourselves in knots because there is no way to to work this out properly. Mm. And they've they've made it more difficult by not playing Broad and Anderson, not playing either of them in the first test. Mm. Um, I would pr- I would find a way to pick Leach. Uh, really, I think so because. He's, he's probably going to have to play some kind of role in the series. And I definitely wouldn't have played him at the Gabba. Wouldn't have considered for a second playing him at the Gabba, especially with the rain around, which actually didn't affect that too much in the end. But I, so, think, sorry, well, I, think, I, I think at Adelaide, I think at Adelaide, you know, it does spin towards the back end of the, of the innings. Um, uh, Nathan Lyon's got a very good record there. So finger spin does have a chance. Um, and in day-night tests as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, I, the truth of it is it's a very, very difficult call for anybody to predict. And as we saw with the first test match, you know, experts so-called can line up and say, well, this this has to be the way and this will be the mm. way. And then it turns turns on a dime. Um, I, w- I was totally comfortable with playing Seamers and Seamers only at the Gabba. I'm less comfortable doing that um, in this particular test match. Mm. There is another thing with the pink ball and finger spin that as we saw in India, albeit of course on, you know, on, on raggers, the balls, the lacquer on the ball seems to give it an extra kind of boom, if you like off Mm. the pitch. Now, um, Jack Leach needs a bit of, bit of assistance from the pitch and it's maybe naive to think, okay, pink ball evening, seamers, seamers and seamers alone. Uh, Lions record not just Adelaide is good but also with the pink ball is good uh, we saw that Ashwin was unplayable with the pink ball earlier in the year um, and that Leach bowled well with it as well in that test series so I'd probably lean towards playing him I think in this game um, my instinct okay answer Leach Robinson and Broad and Anderson my long tail problematic long tail. Yeah, maybe may, maybe not broad, and maybe Wokes. Maybe give Wokes another game. Yeah, probably Wokes at eight. This is it. I mean, it's, it, you can't you can't arrange these. Yeah, satisfactorily. it's really difficult. It's really really difficult. Ben, someone else help me out here. Yeah, well, the the, the points on Leach are interesting. I guess the one thing uh, sort of against him is that if, if this is going to be kind of like a a bit of a harem scarum game as these donut tests can be, then perhaps you don't need that. Uh, uh, that spinner to hold down then but then, but then it's not as if you know all day night tests are 200 plays 200 you, Australia might well still score 400 and then you you do want a guy who can hold up an end and, and get a bit I, I also as think they did last time out right yeah and they batted for, for a really long time in that game didn't they yeah and yeah. that game went five days yeah. and you know Milan and Root were scoring runs on day four there as well so but I, but I think the other thing with with Leach is that I, I do agree definitely as a plot still to play in this series I think that if you look at his you know his career uh, overall, he has shown. I mean, I think it's probably masked by his uh, 
uh, cult hero status and is like, you know, the, pa- the fact that he can seem like he's underestimating himself when he sort of says, oh, I'm just happy to be here, sort of that kind of persona. But he is very mentally tough. I mean, you know, you almost died in New Zealand and then came back to, uh, to, to, to start later on. He, he, got, he got that pounding in the first test in India and then uh, came back to have a very good series. That's a good point. After that, I, th- I, th- point, I, think, yeah. I think he is a, he is a pretty tough kick, a, a tough that, nut. Um, he's a, that was the, the India, th- that is a good comparison India match because he came back during that test. Mm-hmm. But that was just Pant going after him. And the concern with Australia is that it's the whole team going after him. And, and, and there's obviously not as much in the pitches for him. I, I, I would have liked to play Leach at Adelaide at the start of this series, but given what happened at the Gabba, I don't think you can play him. Right. So the, are you are you no spinner or are you are you Bess? No, no spinner. Right. So from here on not, in Well no, I mean I mean I hope that England would win at Adelaide and then there's a bit of momentum shift a bit of confidence in the side Australia have a few more doubts and then you can bring Leach back mm-hmm. in I think okay. they'll need to play a spinner at Sydney probably J- just yeah. quickly on best just quickly on best best took uh, a fourth for, for the Lions in that game against Australia A but if you actually watch the highlights three of those four wickets in the first innings basically drag downs and he went well over four and over in the Australia second innings as well so they can't, they can't play yeah. they the, can't, yeah. based on what we've seen of his test career so far this is not the time to throw Best back in. Yeah, I, I don't. I actually don't think it would be fair, really, at this point, mm. and it would probably push him backwards overall. Wait, wait, also, wait, sorry. what what in terms of what it would do for Jack Leach as well, if you pick best above Leach, then I mean, you can't really bring Leach back into the series either. Mm. I think they've messed him around enough already. I think at this stage, go back to your seamers, play to your strengths, and hope it's enough to get you one all, and then you can go back to a kind of an, a normal, a more normal formula. Uh, for the third test onwards. Stoke, Stoke struggled with the ball in Brisbane, bowling full tilt in the nets in the last 24 hours, uh, hit root on the head. Mm. Um, Did he? Yeah. yeah. Is that? Oh, it's, it, I think McPherson might have filmed it from right behind. It's terrifyingly fast. I just don't, still don't understand how they do it at that level. But Stokes anyway, I know that there were injury concerns around him. Mm-hmm. He was certainly not um, giving any indication that he was in trouble uh, yesterday. Uh, and obviously he looked very rusty um, with the ball. His figures weren't great in that first innings, but I think that possibly frees up the possibility of Leach if if Stokes, if you can actually hang your hat on Stokes to get through 20 overs in innings. Mm. The, the other thing as well, just sorry, is that I know that Mark Butch talked in the last podcast well about how England have handled Leach in the lead up to this series. And this is a, another test of how England will handle Leach going forward and of their man management. If you go back to the, the last S series in 2019, you had, had Mo and Ali, who was obviously not in great form, was dropped during the World Cup. Uh, there was an injury to James Anton, which meant he had the belt quite a lot in that third innings, which is often not his his best role. And he, he got, you know, they took the attack to him. It was a match-winning partnership between Smith and Wade, and then he didn't bowl again the series. And that based that almost, and then England chose not to give him such a That was kind of the, you know, almost the last we saw of Mo and Ali as a, as a serious test cricketer, really. And England now have, you know, there is another spinner who has been given a pounding and kind of yeah. how they respond now, whether that, and they, you know, only they can know how he's holding up and uh, and yeah. how the pitch is going to play or they can, only they can make a proper guess at that. So, I mean, I'm not saying they have to play him, but they do have to, like, it's not that there is a, a big test here just in getting the best out of Jack Leach, you know, even after this series, the next few years going on, like, they need to consider that quite carefully. I think. Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think if... I heard what Butch said last week, and I, I understand exactly where he's coming from. Um, I think if we if we respect the the bloke's Test match credentials as we should, um, then you have to you have to consider, as Ben's rightly saying, what what happens to Jack Leach in the third Test, in the fifth Test, and next year, and so on and so on. I think if you you do run the risk of destroying the kid's career if if you just you know leave, leave him on the on the outskirts for for. A, five six weeks from here on in to stew over one you know eight mm. nine over spell when he hasn't played any red ball cricket in the best part of a year yeah um, I, I, I think there is a duty of care there as much as anything else i think on leach as well i think he does he, he does quite often start tours and series not that well so in 2020 he's not much not getting much of a game beforehand that's, well that's true there's that and i mean in 2020 before the home series against west indies so best had those couple of good tests in south africa when leach was was ill um it was, it was almost a shootout between the two of them in the inter-squad games and leach bowled pretty badly in those games wasn't picked best gets the nod uh in india obviously started that series not particularly well and got got into it i'm also kind of of the opinion if leach is your number one spinner 
those 13 overs shouldn't change anything, right? Like, do that, do, do, can 13 overs seriously change your opinion of the, your spinning backing order that much? It really shouldn't. If, if Leach has been your number one man for a certain period of time, 13 overs shouldn't change anything. The problem is it's not, I don't think that would change their opinion. I think it's probably reinforcing what they already thought, mm. that they don't think he's good enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can say something? Can, just briefly, as an aside, um, I haven't spoken to anyone about the, the, the cricket of late, so I'm just going to keep shouting at you. Yeah, sorry. The thing that really that got to me towards the back end of the innings, uh, the back end of the, the test match, was the Ollie Pope dismissal. Because we, we've all got so much time for the, for the boy, and it, there's clearly a real player in there. But that was so garbled, that shot on the final day, where he's trying to cut an off spinner five minutes into his, into his uh, innings. And you said on the, on the show a few days ago, you're bang on. Um, there's a frenetic nature to his game, which, which is definitely getting him into trouble. And it put me in mind of a conversation that he had with Joe a year or three ago when he said, in the early part of his career, playing for Surrey, he was so uptight about getting to 20, had to get to 20. And he was, he was overloading his mind in the, in just in the early year or so before he started de demolishing county attacks. And that stuck in my mind when I was watching him. And even though he's now played professional cricket for four or five years, he still feels like a, psychologically like a bit of a bit of a young lad. He's you played know. more tests than Marnus Labuschagne. I know, I know. And I saw that stat on on Twitter the other day, which which again is kind of terrifying. But he doesn't look it, does he? He, he still looks yeah. like he's still trying to find his rhythm and find maybe a little bit of self belief to qualify that as well. I mean, Labuschagne, I know. He, he was in and then he was out briefly, but mm. since the Lord's test, he has been absolutely in that side, immovable, largely because the runs he mm. scored. Whereas Pope has been in and out. He has not had a block of cricket in the way that mm. a, a, an unsettled, sorry, unbroken run in the side in the way that Lambert yeah. has. But, but to, oh, take, to take it back to what, two, two, summer, two winters ago, Port Elizabeth, masterpiece of 100 by Pope. Mm. And he'd made runs, I think, you know, a few runs in New Zealand the time before that. Obviously, he's the star of English cricket, the next generation star. Uh, and watching him, just as we've watched that Crawley for the last 12 months as well, it's been, it's just been uh, bafflingly frustrating really to, yeah. to try and get to the bottom of it. So I, I, I agree, I agree with all that, but I think a few of our listeners have, have said that we possibly give Pope an easy ride because he well, averages 100 at the Oval, <laughs> look at where we work. Um, and I, I think even in some of his big hundreds at the Oval this year in in county cricket, I think he was he was really frenetic when he's well past thirty. I just think he can get away with it at the Oval in county cricket. He's, he's his talent is is so high that um, he will get through periods and he will just score a hundred off one hundred twenty uh, hundred twenty balls every now and yeah. at, every now and then. Um, and I think it's not just the mindset thing. I think it's I think it is technical as well. He gets so low. Yeah, I think. Um, and in the past, it is, it is in the my, past, it is mindset when you're cu you're trying to cut an off spinner within in ten but ten minutes, and he did it also mm. at Edgbaston last summer against Patel on day one, trying to cut a cut a left arm spinner when he's he's not on twenty odd or he's just got to twenty odd early on, a slightly up and down track on day four, um, and it was up and down, it was quite dramatically up and down, which again just brought into into focus. If England had bowled him out for three hundred, there might have been a game on. There mm. genuinely might have been. Anyway. Um, Pope's innings concerned me. Um, now, we might see he'll go out first innings, you know, Adelaide, slightly easier batting conditions, and he batted okay in the first innings for 30-odd. We might see him get, him get himself into the series, but that that approach was concerning to me. Um, and that whole morning was frustrating. M Milan ran down the pitch, but he was hoodwinking himself. He ran down the pitch and then tried to block it. You know, it, it was there to just put your hands through it, put your hands through it. Or work it through mid wicket for a couple. In the end, he blocked it inside edge court. Root's shot was tentative. Butler's shot was tentative. P Pope's approach was garbled. Mm. You know, Stokes was becalmed, completely becalmed. Didn't know whether to twist or stick. And there was, I'm not saying that they were going to win that game at all, and they weren't going to save it with two days to play. But the the approach on day four was concerning for me. Mm. It, it felt. I mean, obviously, the, we we all know that England batting home is a bit root or nothing. But it felt like the players kind of believed that as well, that when Root got out, they all kind of thought, I need to do something really special here and that's going to win us the game. 
so they were trying to sort of do this sort of like counter-attacking, like score really quickly thing. Whereas you, they didn't need to do something special. They just kind of needed to, to, to just keep batting normally. I mean, they had a, they had a good platform. The bowlers, you know, bowled a lot the, the, the day before. You just kind of start again, like get, get, give half an hour to Australia and then, and then and then and then see where you're at rather than what well, is Stokes run hoof his fourth ball. For that, six that, was, was, that was that was I think the worst bit of the morning. Stoke, I don't know if you saw it. Stokes yeah, the, tried the to big hit. wahoo and he missed it by miles. Yeah, what was he against doing? Lyon. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, um, Ben, we mentioned before, uh, but I think it's worth going over this again. Um, why, why day night tests aren't possibly quite as good for England as, as people sometimes make make it out to be. Um, Australia are eight from eight in day night tests, and Australia's bowling surely will will suit the pink ball and, and when it's harder to pick out the ball as much as England, if not more so than England. Yeah, as you mentioned with those stats earlier of, the, of, of their bowlers, and I think England have been bowled out for 120 or less in all of their last, or three of their last four day night innings. Obviously, they're bowled out for 60 odd in New Zealand and then uh, also for single figures, or double figures in, in India. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess, that, I mean, it's it's not totally bogus, I don't think, in that, you know, that was just about the close England came to winning a game uh, last time out in Australia when Anson took that five for. Um, and I guess you, you can sort of see how, you know, if you do really manage to, to skittle Australia, this is this, like, it, it, England's, I think the only way England really win a game, and I can't see England really making, that there's the difference between 20 and 20, 20, it's tough to see England actually making those 450s that they did last time. But if England can skittle Australia once, and that is their route to winning a game on this tour, mm. and a day-night test gives them a bigger chance to do that, I guess. So that that's the that's the thing to take. But yeah, Australia have a brilliant record in day-night tests. Um, and even when they kind of, like, there have been times when you'd expect them to lose a day-night test. There was a game against South Africa, a few years back where they lost 2-0 they're in absolute shambles uh, Duplessis scored a, a brilliant day 100 and then Australia just like cruised it mm. from then on uh, so they, they, they know what they're doing at Pinkball Test Mark Wall made quite a good point on commentary about how you have um, massively different conditions within a day so um, when it's when you've got a newish ball or um, it's it's in that twilight period batting's really really difficult but he said when the sun's out and the, the ball's old, it's really, really easy to bat. The the, ball, the the pink ball gets very, very soft reasonably quickly. So you could just get particularly lucky or particularly unlucky with conditions, I think. And that could have quite well, a big part this, this is why I'm giving them more of a chance. Not because they are superior with the pink ball by any means at all. Just that they might get lucky and the conditions absolutely fall in their favour. Mm. Conversely, it could go the other way and they're actually it's twice as difficult to beat Australia because they can't really beat them in, in, in kind of neutral conditions mm. and they might find themselves on the on the tough end of it, uh, batting in the worst conditions against their bowlers who are masterful with whatever colour ball they've got in their hand. Mm. So I, I think it's, it's almost kind of toss of a coin stuff for England, whereas Australia can just be comfortable with the fact that they've got the better side for the conditions. Um, the run out blog asks, Hi, everyone. I was, I was just wondering if any of you had any thoughts as to why Stokes has changed his stance to be more front on. In the warm-up videos, he seemed to be accessing a lot straighter down the ground, whereas before he was hitting mid, mid-on, mid mid-wicket a lot more. But then he, when he faced a high pace of Cummins and Hazelwood, he didn't look as comfortable and twice he got scared, squared up and it took the shoulder of the bat. For a man whose technique was almost perfect for Australian conditions and whose game was built around a few vital scoring areas, he seems to have made a last-minute change. And I'm just wondering... If you had any thoughts on why, I'd like to add that he did get two absolute sto- snorters from Cummins, but I feel that those were made even easier by Stokes's stance. Any any thoughts on that? I th- the, the second one was round the wickets, which kind of negates uh, that point up to a point, up to, mm. to an extent. Um, and that one kicked off a length when the ball was, when conditions were increasingly up and down. Uh, the theory is that. Stokes is a is a high, high, high end player, and the better you are, the more chance you have of really making the open stance work for you. Um, one of the traps I think that English players have potentially fallen into is that their bar of talent is maybe there, and they're trying to access a little bit more by opening up their stance and turning themselves into Steve Smith. But you are you have to be absolutely brilliant to pull it off in swinging mm. conditions. Stokes, of course, is good enough. And so I think his theory is he's going to get a lot of short stuff. He's going to get stuff in at the ribs in, in Australia. If he's slightly more open-chested, he's going to be able to access the onside a little bit more comfortably. 
you see players who are a bit closed off, a bit too side on, and they've got nowhere to go. And you see it with left-handers in particular in Australia, um, especially with that kind of left arm round angle, the Stark angle, or with Cummins coming in at you hard. So I can understand the theory, I think. Um, and I wouldn't read too much into that first in his dismissal either, to be honest. I mean, he's got in behind it. He's played it straight. Uh, the bat is not coming from a peculiar angle and it's not to do with his setup or his feet. I don't think that he's nicked that. It's just the first hour of the day and, you know, conditions mm. and so on. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how it goes. And I would also add that while it looks a bit more dramatic initially, he does then get into position with his second movement. And by the time he sets himself, there's not a vast difference, I don't mm. think, between what we've seen with Stokes before yeah. and what we saw here. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I you guess know. the timing of it is quite interesting, given how well he did in Test Cricket 2019, 2020. Uh, and since then, he's only played in Asia. Yeah, uh, there's also a point, and this this sounds silly, but cricketers talk about this all the time, that things creep into their game that are not necessarily planned or a subconscious technical hmm. evolutions or descents almost, you know, and... And I'm, I'm not saying that Stokes has not planned this and spoken to Thorpe about it, who, of course, is another Southpaw himself. Um, but it might be that he's just finding his way a little bit, having obviously not played any cricket. So it might be that what we saw um, in the warm-up game and what we saw glimpses of at Brisbane is maybe an exaggerated version of what he will eventually, by the middle of the series, end up playing like. Mm. You know, So um, it would be, yeah, it's worth take, keeping an eye on. And it's obviously the big technical issue of the day. Uh, I can understand it more with left-handers than I can with right-handers that you open yourself up to the right arm over angle. Mm. But we shall see. Well answered. Um, Lord Ian Botham is arguably one of the greatest cricketers that England has ever produced. Arguably. The 1981 Ashes, dubbed Botham's Ashes, were undoubtedly his crowning glory. What is less well-known is Ian's lifelong passion for wine and the art of creating it. 40 years as an international cricketer and commentator took Botham to wineries and vineyards across the globe. In the development of his own range of wines, he worked passionately with renowned winemakers to create bespoke blends to his exacting standards. Only when a wine is good enough to go on his own table does Ian allow his name to go on the label. Over the course of the Ashes series, we are working in partnership with Botham Wines to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Botham's Ashes. Stock up for Christmas now at BothamWines.com where you can also buy his 22 yards London dry gin and his gin-filled Christmas baubles. Joe, what's your moment of the week? Um, so my moment of the week was tucked away at the bottom of a press release announcing India's test squad to tour South Africa. Uh, and if you read to the bottom, it said, the All India Senior Selection Committee also decided to name Mr. Rohit Sharma as the captain of the <laughs> ODI and T20I teams going forward. Is that how it played out? Yeah. That's yeah. brilliant. So uh, bottom of yeah, bottom of press release that had nothing to do with the, the big news. So look, obviously Kohli had already said he was stepping down as uh, the T20 captain, but yeah, they, they quietly sacked him <laughs> at the bottom of a press release. So there's no suggestion that Kohli, it's a mutual consent thing? The story from Ganguly's version of events is, apparently Kohli feels that he wasn't informed or there wasn't a proper discussion, but Ganguly's version of events is that Cody said he wanted to stand down as T20 captain. Ganguly said we can't have two different white ball captains. Cody did it anyway. Uh, and then they made a decision to, to bring in Rohit Sharma. But as Bennett pointed out before when we were chatting about this, if that's the way they're going to do it, why didn't they announce that Rohit Sharma was going to be ODI captain when Cody stepped down and you could have saved yourself this this kind of circus? And it, you know, it's, it's got a little bit lost for obvious reasons with English cricket mm. focused on, on other matters. But this is a, a big a, thing. A big story, and it's really, I think, with Ganguly there, for so long, Kohli has had things all his own way in, in Indian cricket. And, you know, a lot of it has gone right, and you can see why they've they've let him do that. But with Ganguly there, who we know even as his time as a captain, he was he, he liked to, to hold on to power. He liked to, to run things. When he didn't like how things were going, he would fall out with some pretty high-profile coaches. And it does feel like the kind of tectonic plates of, of Indian cricket are shifting, and, and Kohli is no longer able to call the shots. Um, and it'll be, re it'll be fascinating to see how it plays out from here. There is an argument, I think quite a strong argument, that it will do Kohli the world of good in terms of his batting. Uh, he hasn't scored an interna international 100 in more than two years now. I think it's, yeah, 15 ODI knocks and 23 test knocks that he's gone without 100. Um, there was too much on his plate. Yeah. But I don't think any of us thought it would be decided for him. I mm. think we all thought he would... It was hard to imagine Cody playing for India without being captain. 
it's even harder to imagine him being told that he was no longer to be captain, whether he wanted to be or not. Um, so will Coley be able to kind of grin and bear it and go out and score loads of runs and, and just be happening, happy captaining the test sides? Very possibly. Equally, he might become a bit disillusioned with, with the way things run at the BCCI and there might be more to come. I think, Ben, you were saying there's speculative reports that like a few players are upset about this and well yeah i mean also it's just just tough to make out make out what's fact and what's fiction i think with with this whole thing because everything's done through uh, through reports and through a couple of sort of like favored journalists and nothing comes out th- actually through you know the, the proper channels and no, no one does press conferences and that sort of thing i mean and also india don't ever really drop players i mean it was quite amusing in the toss before the second new zealand test and Cody said they had a uh, three niggle based changes, uh, which was quite a funny way to put it. Uh, and then so so Rohit Sharma sort of uh, was reported for like you know six hours four. It was actually confirmed that he was uh, out of the test series. Then it was originally reported he was out of the ODI series, but now it seems like he'll be fine for that. Cody's going to seemingly miss that ODI series for his daughter's first birthday. Um, uh, so, but then but then people are like is it is it really for his daughter's first birthday or is it for? Uh, but for other reasons, because now there's sort of possibly a rift forming between Cody and Rohit. Uh, even reports that Jadeja might retire from Test cricket, and that could be completely unrelated. But then, who knows about that as well? I mean, it's that there might not be a rift. It might not. Be, it might be, you know, completely, you know, fine. And the, you, these guys are big enough to sort of say, like, oh, it's a bit of a, a tough decision, but I'll just carry on. And maybe those things are all the reasons why. But when it's coming out in this manner, uh, it is hard to trust and that will fuel the speculation the feeling of sort of unease around it the other thing i would say as well is that to me rohit is quite an odd person to pin a change of white ball era around because he's he's older than coley isn't yeah he? right and, and and they've got kara hall he's got you know he's, he's a he's a brilliant white ball batter he's uh you know he's, he's in his prime he's got uh captaincy experience in the ipl he's admittedly he's not got the uh ipl uh record as a captain that rohit does but um yeah it seems like you know Row, it's going to take them, you know. The, it just feels like it's his turn, though, isn't it? It's ba- sort of basically, uh, yeah. Tony I, Blair, Gordon Brown vibes. And I guess that if, if yeah, exactly. If, if they feel that Rohit is the guy that will win them the next World Cup in India, then that is justification enough, I suppose. But it is all just a bit odd. If, if they've got two World Cups the next two years, and Rohit. Yeah, we'll, there's we'll, we'll plenty of World Cups to, yeah, exactly, <laughs> to exactly. get through over the next few years. Um, it's just Indian cricket has felt, in terms of the national team, has felt very stable for a long period of time. The players haven't really changed very much there's not really many disputes that I can think of. Like I, I always find it interesting with Ashwin, who is a big character, strong character, says what he thinks, has been treated quite like, oddly in terms of not, not featuring away from home. I haven't really ever heard him say anything publicly, mm. criticise Cody. It's, it's like Cody has run such a tight ship that just nothing has seeped out. And now it feels in, entirely different. I suppose Cody and Kumble would be the last dispute. And obviously Cody won that one <laughs> fairly emphatically. Mm. But uh, yeah, Times are changing now. And so, do you know what Raul Dravid must make of all this as well? Obviously, quite a uh, a guy who, who who never got involved much with the sort of the gossip and the uh, uh, and the, and the slightly, slightly pitchy elements that could could get into into that era of of Indian cricket. And now he's just taken over as coach, and it's kind of all just reared its head again, as if almost as if there's like a bit of a uh, as much as you know, Ganguly coming in creates a sort of power imbalance between him and Kohli. Maybe Shastri going as well creates another bit of a power vacuum, and then. Uh, all of a sudden it's just like all chaos and he's just there sort of like sort of shaking his head slightly frowning befuddled it's a it, it will be great to watch how the 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 kind of the the Indian industry react to it all because of course the cameras go to Kohli literally oh, every that? 20 what, seconds what, what, what's Kohli cam gonna yeah, do yeah and, and, and Kohli's you know marketability and Kohli's earning power and Kohli's general everyday iconism is so off the charts compared to all other current players and you include Rohit Sharma in that completely how how's it going to play out it's going to be really really interesting to see how the dynamic plays out not just on the pitch but also through the through the media through the narrative mm. really um Cody will settle in because he's got 43 ODI hundreds um and he's just turned 33 year old and he will obviously have his eye on overtaking Sachin, and he might even still think he's got. I've just looked up; he's got twenty-seven Test hundreds and forty-three ODI hundreds, which is all the more crazy when you think he hasn't made one in in a while. Uh, he he will have an eye on on his his record and his legacy in the end. Um, mm. How much of the eye stays on him as this this titanic figure of the game? 
it'd be really interesting to see how it goes and also how Rowett deals with him as well you know Rowett's famously a lot more kind of phlegmatic and more kind of relaxed sort of character can you do fine leg that please yeah <laughs> well you would wouldn't you god you definitely would uh, yeah I think I think 131 players have scored international 100 since Coley last got one um, my moment of the week is from a while back actually Babra Zam taking his first international wicket um, Pakistan beat the rain as well as Bangladesh at Dhaka to seal an innings win uh, crucial World Test Championship points Pakistan's away fixtures are reasonably favourable they don't play any of the world's top six teams away from home in this cycle uh, and have got some harder home series that you can see them doing pretty well in um, Bangladesh were bowled out for 87 and 205 after Pakistan got 300 odd um, so Babrazan brought himself on for two overs one in Bangladesh's first innings one in their second innings uh, nearly got a wicket in his first ever over bowling international cricket in the first innings, an edge fell just short of slip, and then he got an important wicket as Bangladesh threatened to pull off the draw in the second. Um, but the main thing from that game was... I, I'm good. I actually i am showing that I haven't seen any of this, but what was he bowling? Off spin. Off spin. And yeah. what, what was interesting as well is that in, so it's worth emphasising just how much rain there was, because Bangladesh, yeah. bang, so bang, Bangladesh uh, sorry, Pakistan won by in innings late on the final day, having only made 300. Uh, and there were, what, two or basically two holidays lost to rain. And in that rain delay, uh, the PCB were putting up lots of clips of... Pakistan playing dressing room cricket in which Babrazan was bowling quite a lot and was celebrating at ten for, uh, and, then, and then comes and brings himself onto bowl and takes a key wicket. So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're saying that um, Pakistan has been a Sajid Khan in just his fourth test took eight for 42 in the first innings, the fourth best figures ever by a Pakistani test cricketer. Um, and then for Pakistan, the grind never stops. They're, they're 1-0 up in the T20i series against a very understrength West Indies at the moment. And another 20-year-old quick... Yeah, Mohammed, Mohammed Wasim, another Wasim. Um, yeah. He took a four for, a four for 40 and three of his wickets were Yorkers and he looks pretty quick. Uh, Shadab took three for 17. Rizwan continues his absurd year in T20 cricket, scoring 78 and Heder Ali smashed a rapid 68. Um, Phil, what's your moment of the week? <laughs> Just a small one, really. I went, I went for a walk the day after I moved. Um, in South London to, to my local park, just trying to you know scope out the new area. And there were a couple of nets in this this park. Um, one net was full of a couple of a handful of young lads, you know, having a hit. And then the other net was two Australians dressed from head to toe in Australian kit. And one of them had taken off their Australian Qantas style uh, training top and actually hung it on on the side of the net. And one of them had a dog stick, you know, like middle aged bloke, might have been his son, might have been one of his pupils i don't know but anyway this young lad batting brilliantly he was the old boy was chucking him a dog stick from 15 yards and the boy was giving it the manus giving it <laughs> no run no run as me and my me and my wife just walked past uh, i have photographic evidence as well if you if, if you doubt Amazing. this um so yeah and that was the day after that was the day after the defeat so you know they were clearly That's having a good funny. time of it that afternoon yeah. those chaps i can't remember if i mentioned it on the show but the first ball i faced this season uh, I didn't bat until about the eighth or ninth game of the season. Uh, and we were it was like 60 for eight when I came in. Uh, first ball I faced is a bowler who's a little bit too quick for me. And I'd made the decision in my head, if it's anything wide of off stump, I'm leaving this. And after a, you know, a year and a half of shadow batting, pretending to be minus, I did an, I did an extravagant leave and shouted, <laughs> no run! And I've never felt so embarrassed on the cricket field. Oh, I thought that was um, going to end with your off stump being no, 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 back. No, no, no. It, was, it was a good leave, good leave. Uh, I think in that game, I faced more balls than anyone else in that match. It was like 11 off 51, <laughs> um, if you're wondering. Um, <laughs> I think, I think. <laughs> um, some highlights from, from the world of franchise cricket. Andre Russell is hitting them well. Um, he's averaging 214 and striking at 228 in his last five innings across the BBL. Easy and the peasy. Abu. Abu Dhabi. But he's not allowed 10. to hang out with any of his teammates. Yeah, you were saying this because of quarantine rules. It means that he, he's not allowed to celebrate with his teammates, which is... Uh, yeah, so yeah, he, he hadn't even met some of them because <laughs> he can't hang out in the same place. So he's, it's just very odd. He's part of the team, but not part of the team, but seems to be going pretty well. Yeah. Um, just wanted to mention uh, young Aussie leg spinner Tanvir Sanger, who's only just turned 20. Um he he's doing very well at the moment. He's he's been in the wickets, and in that game against Russell's side, he took two wickets, including um, Marcus Stoinis and Gled Maxwell. And he should have got Russell out. The ball hit the stumps. That the bells didn't come off. Yeah, come that, off. that was amazing over because Russell also got hit in the box earlier in the over, and then smashing a hundred and two meter six. And yeah. a, after he got hit on the box, there was like sort of a slow mo replay of him going down, 
while the, the BBL broadcast, maybe that happens far, maybe it's just what they do, just flashing in the corner. Oh, what a feeling. Yeah, <laughs> um, Sat Sanger averages uh, 17 in T20 cricket. Uh, he's only played two first class games, but averages 21 and arguably more interestingly, his economy rate of just 2.08. Is he related, do you know, to the other? I don't Sanger. think Jason, so. Jason Sanger? I don't he was, think uh, yeah, so. Under 19s, under 19s, under 19s yeah. years yeah. back. Yeah. So Tanvir played in the under 19 World Cup after Jason did. And I think he's already spent time with the Australia T20 squad. Right. And uh, I was reading a report today that said that he might be a bolter for their test tours of Pakistan and India in the next 12 months. Might as well get him in the rhythm, give him a go at Hobart, fifth test. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that would be great. Build I mean, the future. we do need another test match le- leggy. We really are crying out for him, really. You know? Yeah. It's kind of a lost art in test cricket at the moment. Mm. I mean, I guess we, we're literally big up a guy who's played two first class games. Um, but I mean, Swepson is in the squad, isn't he, yeah, as well? You that's know, true. And that's true. obviously, Australia. Do bring them through. Yeah. Meanwhile, Matt Parkinson's what? Where where is he at the moment? Well, the line home, yeah. Flying Flying home, his way home. home, yeah. Having been out there, classic. Um, at the time of recording, uh, Sam Patel is the highest wicket taker and tenth highest run scorer in the Lanka Premier League. So, well done, Samit. Um, <laughs> ben, what's your moment of the week? Well, it was going to be some Cameron Ackmal nonsense, but uh, when you spoke about the Rizwan knock, and I'd like to change it to that if that's okay. Uh, but explain the Cameron Ackman nonsense okay. first. Okay, so he he basically he's been you know it's been a a, a PSL great for uh, uh, Lahore Kalanders I think um, no for Peshawar Zalmi he's been a, uh, he's been a great for Peshawar Zalmi uh, he's their leading run scorer was the top run scorer and the got the most runs in the final the only year they have won it uh, but then they released him before this draft and then the PCB demoted him from the platinum category to the gold category. And then he was actually picked up in the silver category. So it was uh, obviously getting a little uh, a, a demotion in terms of his paycheck. But he then uh, uh, put a tweet out and put up a, a, like a 10 minute long YouTube video saying like, why well, I'm not going to play the PSL this season, describing it as, uh, as humiliating and saying that uh, this is the slot that's for young players and they shouldn't give me this just out of sympathy. Uh, so yeah, it looks like he's not going to be playing in the PSL, which I thought was quite funny. Uh, and that's, it's, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, 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 but the, there is one thing uh, just interested me because his... Obviously, he's for quite a long time now, he's been the leading, he's had more runs this year than anyone's ever got in a T20 I calendar year. And I kind of think that no one's ever going to break this record, which if you're someone like me is, is, is quite interesting. Because <laughs> uh, uh, he's, he's, so not only is he averaging 75 for the year in T20Is, which is ridiculous, uh, he's also played 27 games, which is more than anyone has ever played in a calendar year before. So to do both those things and to have those coincide again is pretty unlikely. Uh, and we were discussing yesterday that the only way that, that someone could break that is if they've just stopped playing ODIs. Because if you go back to when people didn't play T20s, so there was one year when Javid played 43 ODIs in 1999, including 11 in 30 days, uh, four in Singapore, three in Toronto, and then four in Nairobi, uh, which is a quite a never tour. ending tour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, R- R- Rizwan's records never to be broken. He's got, because yeah, 1,200 runs, and the most anyone's got in their career is got to with like 3,300. So he's got more than a third of those in one year. It's crazy. Still got a couple of games to go as well. Yeah. Um, there are absolutely loads of England players who've been signed up for uh, the next. Uh, seasons PSL just run through them quickly Liam Livingston Sakeem Mood, Tom Kohler Cadmore Phil Salt Harry Brooks Aaron Patel Joe Clark Chris Jordan Lewis Gregory Tom Abel Alex Hales Reese Topley James Vince Jason Roy and Ben Duckett so lots lots of lots of talented England players to keep an eye on there um, Joe there's a new magazine out this week uh, what are the highlights yeah it's out on uh, Thursday our last issue of the year Um the cover story is the Yorkshire and English cricket racism scandal. Uh, obviously, it was it was the big story of November, and uh, we needed to cover it in give it the coverage it deserved. Um, so there's very many different threads to the to the feature. I'd encourage people to pick it up. But just a couple of them. I mean, Taha, obviously, who regular listeners will know, was interviewed as in Rafiq in August last year to kick the whole thing off. So he's he writes a piece kind of reflecting on how we've got to this point and. Um, and what Rafiq's legacy uh, will be after all of this as well. Uh, but then we've got contributions from uh, Duncan Stone, who's a Yorkshire-based author and academic, um, kind of looking at the landscape of Yorkshire cricket, not just in professional terms. And then we've got Adam Rutherford, who's a kind of very kind of critically acclaimed author. who wrote the book, How to Argue with a Racist. Uh, and he's written a piece for us uh, about the language of race and, and how it's used uh, and the kind of, 
um, the power structures that exist in English cricket still. Um, so I would heartily recommend going and reading all that. Uh, I don't think we'll discuss it in too much more detail here because we've done so much of it on, on the show. But, um, you know, it's obviously, it goes without saying, it's important stuff. Um, elsewhere in the mag, we've got a fair bit of ashes covered. Phil interviewed <laughs> Dawid Milan, which I think is, even I suppose in that interview, you probably didn't use as many quotes from him as you might usually from a player. No, but I mean, you should have said this last week <laughs> <even> before <laughs> I published it. No, no, but I was going to say, despite that, I think it's in terms of revealing... Uh, a player's personality and what makes them tick and the things they struggle with. Uh, I don't think there are many that are more revealing that we've published. Really. Well, well, that is good news. I spoke to, I did some actual sort of interviews around my subject for once. And I spoke to Gary, Gary Kirsten. Um, we had a good long chat actually on a Sunday morning over the phone. And he is Milan's first cricketing hero. And he also then became close with him on a coach coaching level and every winter uh, for the last few years for the best part of 10 years Milan has gone to Cape Town to Gary Kirsten's Cricket Academy uh, and as Kirsten put it just he uses Kirsten as a sounding board to, to run some theories by him he says it's never about performance it's never about how many runs you scored last week or how many runs you're going to score next week it's all about mental process and technical tuning if you like uh and he was really he was really good on 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 the milan enigma i suppose milan is he's a really he's a sensitive character he's, he's, he has a sensitive nature and i think that that was quite evident in the interview that that he did with me uh it's good that he can now say that which is a sign i think of a person being more comfortable in their own skin he's 34 year old now and he said to me um he was he was very anxious when he was first around the England setup. Very, very nervous. Didn't feel like he deserved his spot in that dressing room. Interestingly, did you see Cook on BT's coverage saying exactly the same thing? Right, okay. Ahead of one of the days of the last test. Said he always thought Milan was a good player, but he just didn't get the impression Milan thought he belonged there at yeah. all, which I, I immediately thought of the interview because it's exactly what he says himself. Yeah, he's, he's a natural introvert in a, in a world that confers power onto extroverts you know, in, in macho dressing rooms and all the rest of it. And I think he was very, very self-conscious. Well, he was self-conscious, he says himself. Um, but the white ball stuff has informed his red ball stuff. And so he now feels like when he walks into that dressing room, you don't have those big beasts looking at him thinking, what, what the hell are you doing here? And you're seeing that there is a kind of quiet confidence now in the way that, that, that he plays. And, you know, he's made a 70 and 80 in the three test matches since he's come back. Um, played nicely, obviously, in Brisbane and so on. So he's an interesting character, and, and, and I've, I've come round to him as well. We, not me personally, but we had a run in a few years back when he, was, he took umbrage at something that had been published um, from, from one of our outlets and all of that, and we had a long conversation on a Sunday afternoon about it, and he was kind of venting at me a little bit, and I thought there was something a bit odd about that. But the more I've, I've spoken to him since, the more... Um, the more on, on, on his side I am, you know. Mm. I, I think it's, it's a challenge for anyone to navigate their way through that peculiar atmosphere of a sports dressing room when you're not in possession of those kinds of natural components. You know, Ben Stokes walks into a dressing room and owns it straight away. Not everybody can do that. He's had a very peculiar career as well. In his, mm. in his, what, now he's 33, 34, and now is, now is the incumbent number three in two of the three formats. Yeah. And hardly not on the team. In it the was interesting format. as well. I spoke to Kirsten, and he said, well, he was always a Red Bull player to me. And he said, he, he, he made his way, or rather, how do you put it? Um, he found his way through white ball cricket, but he said to me he was always primarily a Red Bull player. And so none of it surprises Kirsten, who knows his game inside out, that he's got to this point now where he's mm. starting to marry up the Red Bull alongside the white ball. Mm. Um there's a good piece from Jim Wallace on mm. English spinners as well. Um, Which felt very pertinent watching Jack Leach being taken to the cleaners at, at the Gabba. So Jim Jim starts it. It's a really nice intro. Today. He starts it with uh, a, piece, uh, a line from Warren's autobiography where um, he's bowling to Ashley Giles in the 2006 Adelaide test. Uh, it's first ball after tea. Sorry, Giles is bowling to Warren, Adelaide test. First ball after tea. Uh, Warren comes down the pitch and smashes him for four. Uh, and Giles turns to Warren and says, 
you just don't rate me, do you? Which is <laughs> a really kind of heartbreaking line. Uh, and Warren, obviously being Warren, just turns around and goes, nah. <laughs> and, and Jim, absolutely right. He says that, that that was Warren and Giles, but that could be any Australian, say any English spinner in Australia over the last 30 years, really, with Graham Swan in 10-11 being the kind of one exception. Uh, and Jim looks at sort of some of the past miseries of English spinners and why it's so difficult. He speaks to John Davison, who's the self-styled spin whisperer. He used to play for Canada, people might remember. It's called that World Cup 100. Yeah. Um, and what, he's worked very closely with Nathan Lyon. Uh, so he talks about the challenges of, of bowling in Australia and just says, basically, it's brutal to do well. You've mm. got to be bloody good. Um, and seeing, yeah, seeing the way that Australia came out of Jack Leach um it, yeah it felt like it was it was all um predestined mm. really we had a question on english spinners actually steve asks is it overly optimistic to think there's more chance an english spinner might emerge now due to the importance of t20 due to their importance in t20 cricket and in the 100 obviously red and white ball games are very different they're very different formats but it seems like there's a bigger incentive now for counties to have a good spinner on the books than say 20 years ago and they might develop as red play red ball players after performing in white ball cricket, which I think was quite an interesting question, actually, how how much white ball cricket might help um, spinners in in red ball cricket. I mean, Taha said to us during the test match, he wondered if Leach uh, could have done with playing more white ball cricket. And Leach said himself after being um, taken apart by Pant that white ball cricket would have stood him in good stead there. Those are two really specific examples. Mm. I think more and more there's such a divergence between red ball and white that you see... I mean, you just look at the amount of leg spinners that succeed and prosper in, in T20 cricket and there are almost none to be seen in test cricket. There's such different skills done in such different ways. I, I think it could actually have the, the the reverse effect that some of the players who would have been really good test spinners end up bowling a bit differently and becoming T20 spinners. Um, so I, I, my view is... it. You might you might get one or two, but I think overall the trend is not something to be optimistic about, really. Mm. Ben, what do you reckon? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's tricky one. I mean, it's probably easier to be employed as a spinner now in England than it was before, uh, especially as a, as a proper specialist spinner, whereas before, you know, you talk about spinners have, have to bat a bit to just to keep their, their jobs, basically. But then you do still see counties, even who have very good spinners in their books, still don't really play them very much in mm. uh, the county championship. Like, you know, Crane at times struggles to get a game at Hampshire. Parkinson as well, occasionally at Lancashire. Uh, and, and and those are two of the best young spinners in the country. If you're just like a, a spinner who's making their way, actually, I think you will, even if you, you you might well be in the count in the county setup, but just play the white ball stuff. And they do just pick the seamers for the, for the first class. I thought, you know, have a, have a part-timer or maybe like a, a batting around or at best who can bowl a bit of spin. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, I, I'd say it's, it's not impossible that, you know, having just more spinners in and around stuff and maybe England just see one, who they see playing white cricket, but think there are some transferable skills there, and then give them a punt on, you know, a Lions tour to Sri Lanka or wherever, uh, and then and then build them up that way. That's not it's not inconceivable, but yeah, I don't think I'm holding out hope that you know the blast is going to produce the next Warren. I, I think there's a difference between finger spin and wrist spin to begin with. Wrist spin is increasingly the preserve of, of white ball cricket and not of red ball cricket. Um, in the case of Jack Leach, I think he would be a more rounded bowler if he played more white ball cricket. Um, the problem with Jack Leach is he doesn't play any red ball cricket either. <laughs> he doesn't play any cricket, full stop. I, I genuinely do think that it would it would give him one or two more more tools to, to combat players who take one white ball cricket into red ball cricket. And you saw that last week and you saw that with Pant and so on and so on. Um and, and that is not the kind of thing that he's going to experience bowling at Taunton in, in, in July and August. So I think I think there is I think it's a very good question. I think there is something in that actually. In that particular instance, I think it's odd to have had a cricketer who's got to to the age that he is, who has who's played and taken what 65, 70 odd test wickets or whatever it is, and barely bowled any 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 white ball cricket at all. I think he made his T twenty debut this summer. Right, yeah, there you go. I do think that's quite peculiar. Mm. Um and Joe, you wrote a piece on concussion and how that's becoming a, a more serious a problem that's being taken slightly more seriously within the game. Yeah, it was actually, we, we talked about on the podcast, um, what, a month or so back, and that was sort of the, the genesis of the piece, really. Uh, it was Harvey Hussain's uh, kind of premature retirement and Will Popovsky effectively missing the ashes because of his 10th concussion, which I guess sparked the piece, but also we just have to look at other sports and just see what a big issue concussion is. I think, write it down here, that... Um, 
Yeah, in American football, retired NFL players have already received £821 million in compensation for neurocognitive problems. We're seeing over here, uh, a lot of rugby union players are, are mounting court cases, uh, rugby league the same. And we are starting to see sports change their rules as a result, or at least adapt their rules slightly. Um, rugby unions really clamped down on high and dangerous tackles. So rugby league, they're, they've now issued uh, new mouth guards, which apparently you can tell from the mouth guard whether someone's in danger of concussion. I oh. don't know the technology of this, but apparently that's going to be a kind of a, a widespread thing. Uh, in football, I think it's that you're meant to not do more than 10 high impact headers in training each week. So all the sports are kind of seeing this either already confronting this reckoning or seeing it emerging and thinking we need to take action. And the question is, what action will or might cricket need to take in response? Obviously, it's not a contact sport that the threat is is ball on head. Um and at the start of this year, the MCC uh, started a consultation across the game to see, I'll just get the wording, a global consultation on whether the law relating to short pitch deliveries is fit for the modern game. Um, so I got back in touch with the MCC to ask how that was going. They said they're currently collating feedback with the results expected early next year. I don't expect them to come back and suddenly ban the bouncer, but I, I do feel like increasingly we are heading in that direction. Um, the point we'll get to is no one in the game I spoke to quite a few people in the game no one wants to get rid of it that I spoke to and I didn't get any impression that there is anyone who plays the game that thinks that they should be got rid of as in bouncers mm. should be got rid of uh, I spoke to Andy Lloyd who famously got hit by Malcolm Marshall when his test debut and never played for England again he said you absolutely need to have bouncers you can't possibly take them away they even up the contest Gary Kirsten said the same thing to, to Phil the uh, International Players Union have come out and said they, they want the bouncer to remain. But will we get to a point where cricket can't afford not to take some action on this? Because if they end up with a bill that we're seeing in, I mean, it wouldn't be as big as American football, but mm. anything, even like a percentage of that, cricket's going to be a real problem. So no one wants to see it happen, but but will we eventually get there is the question. Yeah, just on that, Ben, ben you like rugby and rugby... <laughs> uh, Adapt, change its rules, uh, that ch change its rules to, to to new ones that were probably quite unpopular. And they significantly change the game in order to protect players. I guess it's the severity or risk of serious injury is probably greater in rugby. But if that ends up being the case in cricket, and if that is proven in cricket, then we might go in that direction. Yeah, possibly. I guess what's interesting with uh, the NFL and with rugby is what they talk about as being really damaging over time that they didn't really think of time is what they call sub-concussive blows, which are blows that uh, uh, don't give you active concussion at the time, but the accumulated effect of lots of them over time is what can lead to these uh, these serious issues down the line. And I guess cricket does tend to be, you get the occasional very high Im impact blow. I don't think players are sort of getting, uh, you know, when you're playing a rugby match, you might get, you know, 10 or 15 in a game. Players aren't getting that level of something going on in, in cricket. But I also think that with the bouncer, in particular, there is sort of something that is kind of unsaid that is different with cricket to almost any other sport in that the, the threat of the bouncer is, it's just the threat of injury. Like, you know, bowlers will sort of, they'll recoil when a, when a player is hit and, uh, and and there'll be sympathy for the player. But, but that that is really the hidden intention behind any bouncer. I mean, maybe in white ball cricket when you're trying to encourage a rash shot by pulling something into the deep, actually players will still bowl it when, you know, when 200 is needed to win in a session on the last day because they know that just the, the threat of injury might be what causes someone to do something that gets them out, which is uh, there is a, something kind of philosophical going on there, which does, if, if you think too much about it, can make you feel a bit strange. I think that like that, that is the, that's the literal intention of it. It's like, uh, which is different to basically anything else in any other sport, even in, in rugby, I guess you'd, you know, you might do, you're trying to tackle someone and you want to do it as hard as possible to, you know, to let them know you're there sort of thing, but you are still, it's still, part of the game is to you know stop an attack and to get the but within cricket that's the specific thing and that is just odd i guess and that that was the point malcolm knox of the sydney morning herald made in his piece i think it was in late 2019 said we'll look back in horror in 10 15 20 years that we were deliberately hitting people on the head repeatedly that was part of the game and i think that got ridiculed but the fact the mcc took that action only a couple of months later mm. shows how seriously they are taking it also in terms of the frequency of concussions that's an important point i should have made there's there was a study in 2018 of uh, more than 300 Australian professional cricketers 
Um, and they found that head impact occurred every 2,000 balls and concussion every 9,000 balls in men's domestic cricket. So that roughly equates to a concussion in one in every four first-class fixtures, which is, I think, and the, the study concluded that basically concussion is much more frequent in cricket than we'd previously assumed. So we don't know what the effect will be in the long term on, on these players. Players didn't, I mean, uh, Ian Chappell said he never got hit in the head because most of the time he wasn't wearing a helmet. And, you know, you have to protect yourself more. An interesting conversation with Tom Milsom, who's the uh, MD at Airtech, who are kind of one of the leading helmet manufacturers. And he said in, in response to the, the death of Philip Hughes, uh, there was a lot of changing of helmet um, regulations. And in order to prevent that horrible kind of injury, they stopped having as much flex in helmets. Obviously, you've got the, the stem guards at the back, but also helmets don't flex as much. So the ball can't pierce through between the grill and the visor. Um, which he said has solved one problem, but he he thinks it may have created another. And now that you've got basically a rock hard shell that has no flex, so even though you're less likely to get the kind of awful head injury, um, which knocks you down on on the pitch, when you get hit on the helmet, it's he described it as like a snooker ball effect. So your your head is basically just shaking around this helmet, which has no flex whatsoever. And he thinks that this might be a cause of concussion. So whilst you're yeah, as he said you're, you're, you're um, addressing one problem but potentially creating another mm, that's really interesting um, any any other mag highlights Greg Chappell interview John Stern does a brilliant uh, number on Greg Chappell really interesting interview um, uh, Ms. Barol Hack as well opens up on his whole career to Saj Sadiq how many um, pages does that take well it could take the whole <laughs> magazine um, as I've said book? before I, I, th I think he's possibly the most important cricketer of the 21st century I really do I think he's He's an absolute titan of the game, and, and that's brilliant stuff. Joe interviewed Kate Cross, um, who's you know a fine cricketer, carved out a new role in the England side, the Liam Plunkett role, as she describes it, and is also uh, a bit of a media titan as well these days. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's, that's good fun. Obviously, Andrew Miller, Lawrence Booth, Adam Collins turning their hands to various things. Um, and I wrote about my hero, Shahid Ali, who I mentioned on the show a few weeks ago, the coach from Sheffield, who um, gives me hope in an otherwise drab world. Mm. Uh, as always, you can get the magazine at wisdom.com forward slash shop, and that comes out on Thursday. On Thursday, the 16th you, of December. You can also, and shout this from the rooftops, you can also uh, go and download uh, for free F R. E.E., -E, a uh, 112-page Ashes special digital magazine delivered from the fair hands of Joe Harmon and myself and all the rest of us. Uh, it, it feels like it's now or never. So, so go and get it, please, folks. Go and get it the next 24 hours, 48 hours. This you never is know. It might, might be 1-1 one, one by this time next week, and then, and then you will not be reading anything else. Now or never in terms of England's... Ash's hopes, right? I mean, oh, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. doing all right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll roll along for another few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we're fine. Just, uh, just to clarify. I wanted to end the show with an email from one of our listeners, Gus, uh, who wrote in to say, on the topic from last week's pod about creating Christmas gifts, the best one I ever got was the first book of Bob Catchell's Glory Garden series. Classic. At the time, I was a 10-year-old. Uh, ten year old, he's, he's he's talking like you, um, with a with a growing love for cricket. So a book series dedicated to the trials and tribulations of a junior cricket team, as well as the overriding theme of joy for the game, was absolutely perfect. As someone who started captaining my junior side at under twelves, the detail in the books about field placing and tactics was so useful, and I still remember the passion that the author had for former players and test series. All in all, a great Christmas great cricketing Christmas gift and would highly recommend the series nearly 20 years on. I'm exactly the same. I read, I devoured the whole series when I was <laughs> about 10. There's uh, new ones recently as well. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. there was new ones a few years ago. We've got a few copies in the office actually. I'll get one for Christmas. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, I can't remember much about it. I remember there was the, the, the guy who batted 11, Obert, the guy who just listened to the Walkman. Hook and Knight, and, obviously, the, yeah. the skipper. Yeah. Um, but I remember he had one terrible year, but he came good in the final. And actually, <laughs> spoiler alert. I, yeah, I, don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't, don't know which book that was, though. Yeah, but yeah, I, I remember yeah, smashing through that series. There's a question that's come in while we've been recording uh, from a chap called Harry White, um, brother of Barry. And uh, it's too early to start answering his question about root and branch change 
in English cricket that's and all the next of that. issue. But yeah, <laughs> stay tuned, H. That's all I'm going to say. Stay tuned for another uh, couple of weeks. I think that I think that uh, those, those questions were for after the third mm, test. Indeed. Um, X. Anyway, um, I thought this show would be about 40 minutes. Here we are in the 76th minute. Um, cheers, Phil. Cheers, Joe. Cheers, Ben. This has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast in association with Charles Tirrett. Remember to use the code WISDOM20 at checkout. And we'll be back after the second test at Adelaide. Cheers. <laughs>